Good afternoon and welcome to our panel on the case of Mexico against U.S. gun manufacturers. My name is Alvaro Santos. I'm a professor at Georgetown Law and the faculty director of the Center for the Advancement of the Rule of Law in the Americas, Carola. Let me introduce the panel by giving you some quick context. Last August, Mexico's government sued the 10 U.S. gun companies in Massachusetts Federal District Court, alleging that these companies have fueled arms trafficking to Mexico, contributed to Mexico's escalation of violence and loss of human life and economic harm. Since 2007, when Mexico launched its war on drugs, more than 250,000 people have been killed and nearly 100,000 people have disappeared. The theft toll has continued to climb in recent years. More than 200,000 firearms are illegally trafficked to Mexico from the US every year. About 70% of firearms recovered in crime investigations in Mexico originate in the United States. In this panel, we'll explore what the connection might be between these facts and the US gun manufacturers. We have asked our panelists to discuss the reasons for this lawsuit, the main arguments in Mexico's complaint, and the possibilities for success given US regulation and the experience of similar litigation efforts in the country and how this lawsuit may fit in the broader efforts to stop firearms trafficking to Mexico and to reduce violence there. We have a great lineup of speakers and I'll introduce them in the order in which they will speak. First, we have Alejandro Celorio Alcantara, who's the legal advisor for Mexico's Ministry of Foreign Affairs. He has been a member of the Mexican Foreign Service since 2006. And in the foreign ministry, he was deputy legal counsel. In the, embassy, in, the, in the embassy of Mexico in the US, he was head of the Hispanic and Migration Affairs section, where he worked on defending the interests of Mexicans in the US, especially undocumented migrants. He has experience in strategic litigation and in working with pro-migrants and civil rights organizations. He's also been posted to the Mexican consulate in Sacramento, California, as consul for protection, and in the embassy in Paraguay, where he was in charge of political and economic affairs. He holds a law degree uh, from Universidad La Salle in Mexico City, an MA in Sociology of Law at the Oñate Institute in Spain, as well as two LLMs, one in International Transactions and Comparative Law at the University of San Francisco Law School, and another one in the US uh, at the University of Houston Law Center. Um, next, we have Steve Shadowen, uh, who is a founding partner at Hilliard and Shadowen LLP and specializes in economic justice and civil rights. Over his extensive career, he has been lead counsel in numerous groundbreaking cases. Mr. Shadowen is regularly recognized as a top national antitrust lawyer, a result of his dedicated work on cases where intellectual property and antitrust, antitrust law intersect. For his work in securing economic justice for healthcare consumers in 2013, the American Antitrust Institute awarded Mr. Shadowing its first ever national accolade for outstanding antitrust litigation achievement in private law practice. He's been recognized as a best lawyer in America in four categories, met the company litigation, antitrust law, commercial litigation, and antitrust litigation. He serves on the advisory boards of the American Antitrust Institute and the Institute for Consumer Antitrust Studies. In human rights litigation, uh, he represents the families of Mexican nationals killed by US Border Patrol agents along the southern border, obtaining the first ever ruling that Mexican nationals killed by US agents in Mexico can obtain judicial review of those killings in US courts. He holds a JD from Georgetown Law. Welcome back where he was an editor of the Georgetown Law Journal. He then went on to clerk for the Honorable Boyce F. Martin Jr. of the United States Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit. And he's representing Mexico in this case. And uh, next we have Cecilia Farfan, who leads the security research portfolio of the Center for US-Mexican Studies, USMEX, at the University of, the University of California, San Diego. She's an expert on organized crime and U.S.-Mexico security cooperation and co-chairs the U.S.-Mexico security cooperation task force led by 
USMEX in partnership with the Justice in Mexico program of the University of San Diego and the Mexico Security Initiative of the University of Texas. Farfan is a member of the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime, the Urban Violence Research Network, and sits in the Board of Directors of A New Path, Parents for Addiction Treatment and Healing. She holds a bachelor's degree in international relations from the Instituto Tecnológico Autónomo de México, a master's degree in international affairs from Columbia University School of International and Public Affairs, and a PhD in political science from UC Santa Barbara. She has been a recipient of several research fellowships, including the Fulbright Program, the UC Institute on Global Conflict and Cooperation, and Mexico's National Council on Science and Technologies. Each panelist will speak uh, initially for 15 minutes. Uh, then I'll raise a couple of questions and give them a chance to comment on each other's remarks. And then we'll devote the last 30 minutes for Q&A from the audience. So uh, I want to ask the audience to please write your questions in the Q&A uh, button in the Zoom chat uh, and write your name and affiliation. And then I'll pick up the questions and ask them when we get there. Um, we're very thankful to our speakers for joining us today. Welcome, and without further ado, Alejandro, the floor is yours. Thank you very, thank you very much, Alvaro um, Santos. Thanks, um, Georgetown Law and, and Carola. It's um, such a, a privilege and honor to be in this panel with Cecilia, with Steve, and there's also members of the, the litigation team here at the embassy. The government of Mexico is represented in this lawsuit by Steve Shadowin and by Jonathan Lowy, um, chief of counsel from the Brady Center to Prevent Gun Violence. And there's a number of women and men in the legal advisor's office in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs involved in this um, litigation. Um, thank you for your interest on this. This is um, one of a kind lawsuit. It has never been has never been done before. This is a foreign government, Mexico, suing civilly. This is a civil lawsuit in a US federal court in Massachusetts. We're suing um, US companies for their um, trade practices that facilitate illicit traffic of weapons into Mexico. Those weapons that are illicitly trafficked into my country um, that I'm sure you all enjoy visiting um, is suffering um, environment of violence produced by this number in around half a million of weapons a year that come from the US and that are sold in a manner that allow criminal organizations to get very high firepower. We're talking about big rifles. We're talking about rifles with a very long reach, sniper rifles. These are rifles that are killing and hurting and frightening women and men and children in Mexico. That's why we're suing. And we're suing these companies in addition to all the efforts on the diplomatic arena, um, in academia, in open and more discreet efforts to try to change this situation in Mexico. It's been decades that we've been raising the issue that the illicit traffic of guns has to stop. There's interesting mention of the efforts of, the, of Mexico to combat um, the drug cartels in our country since 2006. Since 2004, when the assault weapons ban uh, stopped in the US, there has been an increase in killings and violence in Mexico. And what we'll argue is that by changing some of the commercial practices in their trade, less weapons would enter into Mexican territory. There is a um, moral incentive to do this. We have to do it and we're doing it for the good of Mexicans in our country. 
but there's also an obligation to do it. As the government of Mexico, we resort in all the tools that we have available to confront and address the issues that um, are of importance for our country. To combat the illicit traffic of guns and um, armed violence in Mexico, we often look into three of four um, actors in this mix. We have in one side, the government of the United States. We have the government of Mexico. We have the companies that manufacture, distribute, and sell these weapons. And we have the individuals and organized groups that buy those weapons. We have four actors in this mix. The US government is doing and has done actions to stop the illicit traffic. It has recommended the companies to change their practices, to do some self-policing. It has um, attempt to enact uh, legislation to improve the situation. The US government has worked uh, um, bilaterally with the government of Mexico in do mirroring patrolling, some actions at the border to try to seize a higher number of weapons. And this is um, interesting. In 2020, Customs and Border Patrol seized less than 500 um, guns, whereas the Mexican government seized around 12,000 guns in that uh, fiscal year. There's bilateral efforts. Um, every year, we try to figure out new ways of working in the, in the security level to stop the flow of guns, to exchange information. On the exchange information, it's important to highlight this. Um, there's a traceability resource called E-Trace that allows both the government of Mexico and the government of the United States to know where does a weapon found in a crime scene come from? Where was it manufactured? How was it distributed? Where was it sold? And that way we're able to trace that weapon from its origin, but not only that, to find the routes for the illicit trafficking. It's important to highlight that this information was public. Any person could access this information and it was easier to have a sense of the routes, the magnitude of the illicit trafficking and how things um, uh, behave in terms of, of um, the traffic into Mexico is no longer public. So at the government level, what we do is to, to exchange information and try to prevent the illicit trafficking, but without having all the details of where the, the guns are coming or how many weapons are being manufactured in any given fiscal year, it is very hard for governments to figure out the best way to search efforts at the border. We have a 3,000 kilometer border where there's um, very significant complexity of people trying to cross into Mexico, into the United States, people being returned from the United States after an immigration procedure. We have illicit substances, we have money, we have guns, and we have limited resources, both countries, to try to stop every single item, an individual that is trying to cross back and forth. In addition to the legal crossing of a very robust and dynamic relation at the border, the issue is extremely complex, but both Mexico and the United States have been trying to tackle it. And there's a good efforts, the most recently on, on, most recent on Friday, the new bicentennial framework on security. The third actor in this mix is the consumers. Um, organized crime in both sides of the, of the border, in the US and in Mexico, they are um, prosecuted criminally under criminal law for illicit trafficking. In Mexico, we have a, a crime for the, the use of weapons of exclusive use of the armed forces. In Mexico, you cannot buy as a private individual a weapon of that um, uh, firepower. There's a limited number and kind of weapons that an individual could buy if authorized by only one office in Mexico City. There's only one store 
managed by the Ministry of Defense in Mexico. But there's people with guns in Mexico. Those guns are coming from the US, half a million every year. In 20 years, we're talking 10 million weapons, if we add every year. There's a lot of weapons. And there's an appetite that has been fed by the manufacturers of saying, look at this gun. This gun is very appealing. It is called Jefe de Jefes. This gun is gonna make you feel more man. This gun is gonna make you feel powerful. This gun is for you, drug cartel leader. It's not for somebody living in Connecticut. This gun is for you, so you feel that you are the chief of chiefs. There's some marketing being produced by these companies and the consumers in Mexico and in the US and other parts of, of the continent and the world feel attracted by these products and they try to buy them and they buy them through illicit means. It is clear that we have concentrated as government our efforts to prosecute these criminals, but we don't often look at the fourth and perhaps the most important source of the problem. The manufacturers, the distributors, the sellers of these weapons, of all this situation, while women, men, and children die in a shooting, the ones that profit all the time is the gun sellers, distributors, and manufacturers. You know why? Because it's not only facilitating the illicit traffic into our countries, south of the US border, but they also sell the same um, kind of weapons to the armed forces. So I can imagine the pitch. The criminal organizations are using this rifle. I'm selling you this more powerful rifle. And then criminal organizations, I'm gonna sell you a more powerful rifle that is more appealing. And then go back to the armed forces. And in this violence environment, the only ones that are profiting are the gun sellers, the gun manufacturers, the gun distributors. As a career diplomat, we, I believe in, in diplomacy, in the district and discrete ways of fixing situations. After years of trying, we're building upon what former diplomats and current diplomats in Mexico and in the US to tackle gun violence. It is about time that we bring those companies into accountability and they respond for the level of responsibility in this mix. This lawsuit and the government of Mexico is not attempting against the Second Amendment. That's a domestic and sovereign law that we don't even comment on. This lawsuit is not against the government of the US or their actions that we commend. It is difficult to control the border as the US will know and Mexico will know. It's not a lawsuit against Americans, our neighbors and friends. This is a lawsuit against the companies. We don't want to end gun trade. That's something that would be impossible with this legal effort. What we want is if there's gonna be a gun trade, it has to be transparent, accountable, and responsible enough. So if guns are gonna be sold, those guns should stay in the United States and shouldn't be trafficked into Mexico. And what we are questioning is, what are you doing or not doing, gun seller, distributor, and manufacturer, that you're allowing that those guns are easily ending in Mexico? Being a legal effort that is, hasn't been done before, um, I feel very confident in the strength of the legal argument. And I feel a lot more confident that we have the moral ground of doing what we're doing by resorting in all the tools that are available to us. One of them is presenting our case before um, a US federal court. It has to be done. We have to go before the court and hold these companies accountable 
in parallel to what the US and Mexico government are doing to stop the illicit traffic of weapons. I wanna thank again for this opportunity um, and I'm gonna be very um, attentive to your questions or comments and ready to answer them. Thank you very much, Alvaro. Thank you, Alejandro. Next, uh, we have Steve Shadow. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to come back to my uh, alma mater and, and uh, participate in this seminar. It's a, a pleasure and an honor. Uh, so those of you who are more interested in uh, policy and the politics uh, rather than the legal aspects of this case can tune out for a while because I figure I'm at a law school uh, probably speaking to quite a few uh, lawyers and law students, so I'm going to get nerd out on the law here a little bit. Uh, so let me give you the background of this type of litigation. Uh, so everybody knows that there's a, a federal U.S. federal immunity statute called uh, PLACA. It's a, it says in, in some substance that with some exceptions uh, that uh, the, there cannot be uh, law, uh, lawsuits against the gun manufacturers, U.S. gun manufacturers, uh, for, for harm uh, caused by the criminal misuse of guns. And let's set that now to the side for a moment. That, that statute plaque was enacted in 2005. What happened before 2005? In, in the late uh, 1990s, early 2000s in the United States, about 30 US cities and counties uh, brought lawsuits just like this one. You could take the, the name of the government of Mexico uh, off of the caption of this case and, and put in city of St. Louis, city of Chicago, uh, city, of Los city, city of Los Angeles, whatever, whatever. About 30 of these lawsuits. And, and, the, and the essence of those lawsuits was a claim of public nuisance that these gun manufacturers, most of the same gun manufacturers we're suing in this lawsuit, uh, were failing to monitor and discipline their distribution systems. The manufacturers of all other products uh, in the United States do monitor and discipline their distribution uh, systems because uh, they're worried about tort liability in the United States. So what these cities and counties did in the United States is they brought, in essence, tort claims, public nuisance lawsuits against the gun manufacturers saying that they had failed, they had, in essence had polluted uh, these cities and counties, U.S. cities and counties by failing uh, to discipline and monitor their distribution systems. And what happened was, uh, in, in the beginning, it was a little bit of rough sledding for the plaintiffs. So some of the cases got thrown out uh, on grounds of proximate cause, that the, there was too many intervening causes, that the criminal conduct uh, of third parties had intervened between the defendant's uh, assumed negligence and the harm that were suffered. But the tide started to turn, uh, as, as is the nature of these cases. The plaintiffs sharpened their arguments, got more evidence, got better at presenting their case, and they started to defeat the motions to dismiss uh, these claims. And one, and one case got so far as the late great uh, Honorable Jack Weinstein uh, <clears throat> wrote an opinion after a, a bench trial that was absolutely scathing in terms of the liability of these defendants and a roadmap of how to get their act together. Here, here are 20 things that you can do to significantly improve uh, the situation on, on the ground. So then the next thing that happens is that the gun manufacturers ran the Congress because now they see they're against this title of litigation in the United States and they got PLACA enacted. And uh, that's where uh, things uh, that in essence cut off this type of litigation brought by US cities uh, and counties. Well, uh, as Alejandro said, the government of Mexico uh, has tried everything in its power, so has the U.S. government, to stem this tide of gun, uh, of illicit gun trafficking into Mexico. 
Uh, and so uh, the government has now decided, the government of Mexico, they're going to pick up where the U.S. cities and counties left off because uh, we were retained, uh, I and the Brady Center, and, and with the help of some of the world's leading experts uh, on these issues, looked at PLACA and determined it's clear as a bell that that gun immunity uh, statute does not apply when the injury and the misuse of the gun that caused the in injury occur outside the United States. To, to take but one example, uh, you'll, you'll recall I said that the, the immunity applies for injury that is caused by the criminal misuse of a gun. What do you think the chances are that Congress intended that in determining whether or not that statute uh, applies in a particular instance, that Congress intended the U.S. courts to examine the criminal law of Mexico to determine whether or not the misuse of that gun was a criminal under the law of Mexico. That's never contemplated, never contemplated whatsoever. And that's because Congress was dealing with a domestic uh, problem and crafted the statute to provide immunity only when the misuse of the gun and the consequent injury occur in the United States. You look at the legislative history of PLACA, by that time, in 2005, when PLACA is enacted, the problem of gun trafficking in New Mexico had, had already generated uh, uh, high-level reports by the Department of Justice. It had been the subject of negotiations between the presidents of the United States and New Mexico. It had been the subject of more than 300 news articles in the United States. It was on, it was on the agenda. You look at the leg legislative history of PLACA, there is not a single word about PLACA applying outside the United States. The governments, the people of Mexico, the government, the people of Canada are not mentioned one time in any of the extensive legislative history. That statute had a domestic focus that was intended to uh, to deal with these sorts of lawsuits when the injury and the gun misuse occur in the United States. It, that statute does not speak to what our lawsuit addresses, gun trafficking from the United States into Mexico where the gun misuse and the consequent injury occur in Mexico. Nor is it uh, surprising that that should be the case, that Congress would not have reached out to purport to, to uh, cut off uh, that, that kind, uh, 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 to reach out and essentially try to dictate gun, gun, gun control policy in Mexico. It's not surprising. The general rule of international law with respect to transborder torts is that the law of the place of injury governs in transboundary torts. And what you see here is that Congress, US Congress, respected that principle when enacting uh, PLACA. So let's leave PLACA aside. Uh, is it fair? Is it lawful? How are the courts going to react to the idea that a manufacturer in the United States could find itself subject to liability for injuries uh, caused by its products in Mexico? Well, there are two different scenarios. If there's a one-off uh, injury uh, in Mexico, a one-time occurrence, you could see some, some manufacturer sitting in, uh, in, in Massachusetts saying, I never thought that I could be uh, hauled into court based on uh, that injury. But that's not what we have here. What we have here is a more than 20 year history of foreseeable systemic trafficking of these guns from the United States into Mexico with the US manufacturers firmly placing their head in the sand. And you, you can't do that. The tort law is going to catch up with you. When the trafficking, when uh, the injury is systemic and foreseeable, 
then it is perfectly reasonable to say that the gun manufacturers should, uh, should have to answer uh, in court uh, for that conduct. And so that's what, that's what we have here. Nor do I think, by the way, under international law, it would, in those circumstances, would it, there's a substantial question whether even if Congress intended to provide an immunity in these circumstances, whether they could do so under international law. What kind of interna international law would it be that allows one jurisdiction where the conduct occurs to provide a safe haven for international scoff laws who are systematically causing uh, injury, in this case, mayhem and murder uh, in a bordering nation? So I don't think, uh, I think there's a su substantial question whether that would be permissible under international law, but we'll never get to that question because, it, as, I, as I mentioned, uh, it's clear as a bell that PLACA does not purport to reach out uh, uh, and cover uh, injury and the misuse of guns uh, in foreign nations, including Mexico. Uh, so that's my very dispassionate, objective uh, view uh, of PLACA and how it applies here. So that's a good start for the legal nerds. Um, thank you, Steve. And next we have Cecilia Farfan. Thank you, Alvaro, and thank you, Georgetown, for the invitation to have this uh, very interesting and much needed conversation. And of course, I'm very honored to share this panel with Alejandro and Steve. Um, I'm definitely not a lawyer, so let me uh, give more of the you know context of which in which this lawsuit is taking place because I do think it's important to keep in mind. I mean, when we talk about violence in Mexico, what exactly we're discussing? So, the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime uh, publishes a report, a global uh, report on homicide uh, from around the world. And what's interesting there is the the most recent data that we have. It, it shows us that. About six people per 100,000 on average in the world died of homicide. For the Americas, this number is a lot uh, bigger. In the Americas, we have a rate of 17 per 100,000. And with a region that it's already very violent, we have Mexico that has around 29 um, homicides per a rate of 29 per 100,000. And so we're talking about, again, within a region that is already very violent, we have a country that is experiencing a tremendous loss of life, in this case, Mexico. And as Alejandro was pointing out, a lot of those deaths, not only in Mexico, but in the Americas in general, result, these homicides are a result uh, of using firearms. So just to keep that in mind, kind of just in, in terms of globally what we are looking at. Certainly, I don't think anyone here um, or you know, those who follow violence in Mexico would make the argument that it's only uh, gun trafficking that is the result of violence uh, in Mexico. But what we cannot ignore is that it has definitely changed uh, what, um, what we, uh, sorry, I got distracted by a, a message in the, in the chat. As I, as I was saying, gun violence is not the only reason that we see these high levels of violence in Mexico, but certainly it has changed the nature of what we see uh, in terms of violence in the country. And this is very important because I think when we term, when we think about violence in Mexico, I think a lot of people have an image of like narcos, you know, the Netflix show of criminals killing other criminals. But what I think is very important about what this lawsuit is doing is also helping us and pushing us to think about how violence, lethal violence has changed in the country. Um, Alejandro at the beginning of his presentation mentioned violence against women. And I think what's very interesting is that the work of civil society in Mexico, uh, groups like Intersecta, that the Civica has shown, for example, that the availability of these firearms has also changed how women are victimized uh, in the country. So intimate partner violence um, in Mexico, for example, what we have seen is women are also now being killed at greater rates using these firearms. And so in the context of these war on drugs and these, these lawsuits, I think it's very important to think, well, now women are being victimized in a different way. And homicide rates for women have also increased as those for, for men in the country. So again, this is, this is how violence has, has evolved. And I think this result of having these availability of firearms. I also don't think it's a stretch to say that 
the availability of firearms and how they change this violent la landscape in Mexico is a threat to democracy, not only in Mexico, but also in the Americas. Certainly political violence is not new um, in the country, but what we have seen is also as a result of, again, uh, the availability of these firearms, uh, who, who's getting victimized. So we also have candidates running for office. And of course, to the extent that there's a chance that you're going to get killed in the process or an electoral process, it is likely that then you will, you know, probably not want to run for office. And so what is that doing to the quality of our democracy is also an important implication. I think we have also seen activists getting killed. Um, and again, a lot of, again, uh, using these weapons. And so we have people who, for example, protect the environment against illegal activities like illegal mining or illegal logging. So we have also people defending um, certain spaces within the territory being targeted. And of course, as most of you will know here, journalists are also being targeted. So again, I think when we think about violence in Mexico and we think about these criminal groups, what we also want to think about is how this violence has evolved in the country and how these firearms have really changed um, the landscape. And what's interesting, and this is not a hypothetical, and I, I don't agree with Alejandro just because he is a representative of my government, I agree with him because we have evidence, right? And so as he was mentioning, we do know how it was before we had the availability of these, availability of these weapons. So before we had this all weapons ban labs, what we had seen is we had criminal groups, but it was not as easy for them to access uh, these weapons. Most of my research focuses on understanding how licit conditions for trade can also help criminal groups. So how licit conditions in general aid illicit groups. And certainly the, the lapse of the assault weapons ban is something that has provided a tremendous advantage uh, to these criminal groups. Um, this takes me to another point that I would like to, to make. Um, we at the Center for US-Mexican Studies, where I work, we have carried out a, a survey on the perception of democracy. Those results will be, will be available uh, towards the end of the year. But one piece of information that was very interesting for me, and of course, uh, being in charge of security, something that I wanted to focus on was trying to understand what is a perception of organized crime. And so one of the questions that we included in the survey was whether or not people thought that organized crime in Mexico uh, had greater firepower than the armed forces. And an overwhelming majority of the respondents, and again, this is a representative national survey, believes that criminal groups in Mexico have greater firepower than the armed forces. Now, of course, this is not true. But as I often tell um, my students, in matters of security, perception is reality. And so I think it's very concerning that now we're in a context where, you know, sort of like your regular citizen in Mexico believes that criminal groups actually are, are better armed than their own um, armed forces. And what's interesting here, and again, going back to this idea of how violence in Mexico has changed, I think something that we have to keep in mind as we discuss how criminal groups use um, these weapons has to do with the different business models of criminal groups. I know it's perhaps not the common um, view, but this is exactly what my research, uh, my research focuses on. And what I think it's interesting is to think what criminal groups require very public displays of violence in order to uh, you know, generate their income. And so if we think about very predatory violence like extortion or kidnapping, where criminal groups have to issue very credible threats that unless you comply, there will be consequences. We have also seen um, these groups change how they operate in Mexico. So not everyone is related or involved in drug trafficking, but some of them actually need this very public displays of violence. And of course, in that sense, to the extent that you have these weapons that allow you, you know, you have a 50 caliber weapon, a barret that you can mount on the back of the truck, those threats will become more credible for the public. And so there is a sense also, or what the evidence shows us is that for some of these groups, it's very convenient to have these weapons because again, you have to make people believe um, that you're a very violent actor. So let me just wrap up this first round of comments by saying that we're having this conversation uh, less than a week after the bicentennial uh, framework was announced. And what I think we have here is a very good opportunity to really think about the um, 
what I call our twin tragedies, both in Mexico and the US. And as I was mentioning, the tremendous loss of life on both sides of the border. For years, the United States has asked Mexico to care about uh, drug use in the US and the consequence that that has had. And of course, in recent years, with the introduction of fentanyl, this very lethal synthetic opioid and the main driver of overdose deaths in the US, there is even an urgency of saying, well, we need you to care about these because people are dying. And I think this lawsuit and you know, the conversation that it can open, it's also an opportunity to say, well, we need you to care also about the tremendous loss of life that is happening on the Mexican side. And again, I think these are our sure tragedies. And I think in the context of this bicentennial framework, there's an opportunity to really start thinking about how these transnational challenges um, reproduce this violence uh, and death on both sides of the border. So I'll stop there so we can have a conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much to our panelists for these initial remarks. And so I'll uh, raise uh, one question for each of our panelists. Uh, and, and then after that, uh, we'll open up for Q&A. And so uh, for Alejandro, I wanted your presentation, uh, I think, made the point that apart from this lawsuit, both governments have been working diplomatically for years on this question, and that the US has, uh, was doing a, a big effort to curb drug trafficking. But I can't resist to point out what seems to me like an asymmetry in the way the focus has been placed in the problem of the war on drugs. So, and this is something that Cecilia was just mentioning. Uh, most of the focus has been in curbing drugs at the source. This has been a long-standing policy of the US government trying to prevent drugs from coming into the country. And many of the efforts of the United States in Mexico, Colombia, and other countries have been directed towards that. Mexico has for years raised the issue that, you know, at the same time there's this drug, uh, sorry, this arms trafficking going to Mexico. And there, given the numbers that you've shared with us, there, there really doesn't seem to be much impact. And so if, if in this new sort of bicentennial framework, we're to believe that the governments are treating each other as partners, as it was announced in Mexico, and where we are to expect reciprocal sort of cooperation and treatment, what would be the policies that you'd like to see implemented in the US from an ideal perspective that could really help curb this trafficking of guns to Mexico. So uh, maybe I can ask the three questions uh, and, then, and then let each of you uh, um, re respond. I'm, I'm ready to answer. I'll, I'll okay, perfect, 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 excellent. I was in mute, Alvaro. A year and a half. No, no, I didn't, mean, <laughs> I didn't no. have any doubts that no. you, you're ready. I, I was just no, no. Um, Go ahead. Just, just to answer, um, we call this an, a strategic litigation, and it's not a strategic only because of the merits and the arguments, but on, on the timing. I think as, as peoples, as population, we're ready to address the issue of gun trafficking. And we need to move away from um, just accepting that, well, in the US, the trade is legal and in Mexico it's not. So it's a matter of a border issue. We need to move away from that and not take for granted that it is what it is and it should continue. And unless there's legislative changes in the US, gun trafficking won't end. What we need to do is, and that's why the bicentennial framework is gonna work. And um, there's gonna be a binational working group on, on guns. Uh, that's a good initiative. Um, I mean, it still has to be discussed. There's gonna be a plan presented in December and then in January. but some of the things that we could do, information sharing. On now, um, the information of traceability is, as I mentioned in my opening um, presentation, is not public, but then it's not available to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So with that, it is difficult for us to plan for the next 10, 20 years 
what is that we need to be prepared in terms of, of border and bilateral discussions? Because we don't really know unless we ask where the guns are going through. We don't know how many weapons are being produced. So as a matter of a responsible government, both of us, we should know if there's more rifles produced, we might face more violence. That information sharing is very, very important, not only for um, uh, criminal prosecutions, but also to strategize our um, security um, actions at the border and overall bilateral discussions. Um, I'll talk about migration. Um, armed violence generates displacement and forced migration. In the region, we're facing a challenge of people escaping domestic violence, gang violence, and overall a sense of uh, insecurity. If we wanna address the issue of migration, we need to address the root causes. One of the root causes of migration is the availability of guns. And that is a key of this bicentennial framework. Look at the bilateral relation in a more um, balanced way of shared responsibility. What is that we can understand better of our systems and how can we address this better in a very strategic way of planning the, the future actions to stop um, gun violence and gun trafficking. Thank you. Um, Steve, um, I, I wonder what would you say to the argument put forward by the gun industry that they are selling their products legally in the United States. So you alluded to this in terms of so the foreseeable and systemic uh, trafficking of guns to Mexico, but could you give us a sense for those who haven't read the complaint yet of what are the practices that are going on that you think are responsible for this trafficking and, and damage and how could they change? What could the gun manufacturers be doing to prevent that? And then just uh, an added on to, to that question would be, you know, we have an experience in the United States of companies that have been sued for the results uh, of the harmful results of the products, of course, tobacco, but also very recently, pharmaceutical companies involved in the, in the opioids epidemic. Would you say that the violence that we're seeing in Mexico could be considered an epidemic and that that would be also part of the concern that is that, that the companies know about this and that you know, the magnitude, the sheer proportion of this problem uh, needs to be addressed by these, by these companies? Well, let me take the second part of the question first. Actually, when we were drafting the complaint, we had before us uh, the complaints in the opioid litigation in the United States and the expert reports uh, in those uh, cases. And uh, one of the things that got me uh, interested uh, in those cases, with, it's often said that uh, that's the greatest uh, or the worst, uh, uh, is, is the worst em epidemic in world history. The opioid litigation takes 30,000 lives uh, a year in the United States. And I wanted to check that against the, the about 15 to 17,000 per year in Mexico uh, from the gun violence. So it's uh, on the same order of magnitude in terms of uh, the loss of life uh, that occurs as a, as a result. Uh, but it's essentially the same uh, arguments we hear now, we are hearing now. No one's ever successfully sued a, a drug company for uh, somebody ODing on a lawful uh, on, on a lawful product. What's that have to do with per, Purdue Pharma? They're just sitting up there uh, manufacturing a perfectly legal uh, product. We're hearing that argument. You'll never make any inroads against the opioid uh, uh, manufacturers. They're too powerful. Big farm in the United States, they're too powerful. No one can ever bring them down. It'll never happen. Well, uh, you, you got to start somewhere. And the op opioid uh, plaintiffs uh, started uh, some time ago. We're a little bit behind them. Uh, but we, uh, we think we're going to follow in their tracks. It, it's a change, as Alejandro 
mentioned a change in public perception about the responsibility uh, of responsible law-abiding companies. It's not enough not to simply actively uh, sell your products uh, in, in a way to, or directly or actively. Uh, you have to take reasonable safety measures. You have to take reasonable safety measures when you're the manufacturer, especially of a dangerous product, uh, to ensure that it's not going to cause harm at the end of the distribution chain. What are some of the, the practices that they uh, could use? In today's day and age, think about every product that's out there, scanned data at the point of sale, real-time purchase data, exactly who is buying that product, what product, how many of them. And in, in uh, specifically with respect to uh, uh, gun trafficking, one of the real problems is what's called a straw purchaser, that uh, some person with a clean record who can pass a background check goes into Joe's gun shop on a Monday and buys three uh, Barrett 50 caliber sniper rifles. Okay, maybe that in itself, I would think that raises a red flag. What's what some person off the street need with three sniper rifles? Okay, but that's on a Monday. These manufacturers, if they had the right financial incentives, would have the systems in place that other manufacturers in the United States, because they are subject to tort law, do have in place to have real-time data to say, okay, there was John Smith. This person showed up at Joe's gun shop on a Monday and bought three Barrett rifles. Flag him. Tuesday, he shows up at Sam's gun shop down the street and buys three more. And on Wednesday, he goes over to Joshua's gun shop and buys five AK-47s. Now, with the right financial incentives to get the right data uh, systems in place, these man gun manufacturers would see that happening. We wouldn't be worrying about tracing guns after the fact to find out where they came from once they were used in Mexico to kill a family of seven. We instead would have these manufacturers in a very responsible way saying, hey, my real-time data showed me that person bought three uh, Barrett's at one shop on Monday, three more on Tuesday. When that person's name pops up to buy the, the, the five AK-47s on Wednesday, it's blocked. That person is not allowed to make that purchase. And so we're not going to funerals six months later. So that's, that's the sort of thing that we have in mind that we lay out in great detail in the complaint, all of the different systems we say these manuf manufacturers should have in place because it's not a secret. The Department of Justice over a decade ago gave the manufacturers a list of things that they could and should do to stop gun trafficking. And uh, whatever they did with it, whether they literally threw it in the trash, they at least figuratively threw it in the trash because they didn't do a blessed one of them. Then Judge Weinstein gives them a list of things uh, to do. It's essentially the same list. Instead of doing it, they ran and got PLACA enacted. So at every turn, the gun manufacturers, when asked, pleaded, begged with to do the right thing, just the sorts of things that other manufacturers throughout the U.S. Uh, commerce do to have reasonable safety measures in place, they say no. And uh, if the United States, as a matter of its domestic policy, chooses to let that kind of reckless, life-threatening conduct happen in the United States, well, then that's their business. But when it's systematically causing injury through the misuse of these manufacturers' guns in Mexico, now it's Mexico's social policy that determines. And so uh, the answer is that uh, 
the opioid litigation is out there. It shows the way, both in terms of uh, specific legal strategies and tactics and theories that will work. But more importantly than that, it shows as a, as a social matter how uh, tort litigation can start uh, slowly, sometimes with losses, you get bruised and battered along the way. But you're, when you're on the side of, of justice and everybody knows as a matter of common sense that this conduct needs to stop, well, then uh, I have faith uh, in the U.S. courts that in the end uh, that, will, that will prevail. And here we have the legal means to uh, use tort law in that way because Congress in PLACA did not preempt uh, or provide immunity for uh, this type of lawsuit. Thank you, Steve. Uh, so Cecilia, you made this really important point uh, about how violence is tearing down Mexico's basically social fabric, but also um, undermining its democracy. So the rise in crimes and, and basically killings against women, and also, you know, the, the killings of activists and journalists. Uh, and so we're seeing a problem that, you know, probably we haven't seen in Mexico in our lifetimes, or for sure we haven't seen. Uh, and so this raises a question to me, which you alluded to the war on drugs. Um, it seems to me like this is an indictment on the war on drugs more broadly in that, you know, whatever were the intended objectives of curbing drug, drug consumption and trafficking have been outweighed by the social damage that we've seen by that war. Alejandro was mentioning how, uh, you know, gun manufacturers are uh, selling to both sides of that war, to criminal organizations and to the Mexican government. And so what we're seeing in effect, it's a race uh, to buy weapons. But my, my question is this, in all illegal markets, there's always the, the problem that, you know, there's a huge market and there's a demand for that. And so if you block a source from that supply, in this case, you know, the United States, we might see a change or a turn towards buying weapons from other countries or other jurisdictions. This happens, it's a well-known phenomenon in the drug eradication uh, efforts where, you know, if you curb uh, drug uh, production or, or um, uh, cultivation in one country, it would move to another one. And so, it seems like we're not really going to be able to address the problem of drug, of oh, sorry, of gun trafficking and violence if we don't address the central problem, which is the war on drugs, and we don't have a better way of dealing with this, uh, basically th these drugs in, and keep them in the in the illicit market. So I would say this might be an opportunity to revisit that model and call for drug regulation, um, but I'm very interested, given your expertise in this matter, in knowing what will you think about this. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think what's interesting about this bicentennial framework, for example, is that it uses a language that we had not seen uh, used previously uh, in relation to drug use, right? And so recognizing that punitive and criminalizing measures have really failed uh, to deliver any results. And so the Biden administration, for example, is calling for evidence-based measures against that. And I think that's obviously a step in the right direction. I think in the case of Mexico, we could certainly see a greater effort uh, locally. I think internationally, Mexico, and of course, led by the foreign ministry, has made a tremendous effort uh, in trying to rethink uh, drug use as a health issue rather than a criminal one. And so certainly, I think again, this loss of life that we have seen on both sides of the border should really, you know, we are pretty late already, but it, it encourages to think, well, this needs to be treated as a health uh, issue, not, not a criminal one. I do think, though, in terms of what you mentioned about um, stopping gun trafficking, certainly black markets will always exist as long as there's a demand and there's some regulation, you will have some degree of that kind uh, of activity. I think what's very interesting in this particular case is that what we have seen from other governments is a, a greater sense of responsibility, how they manage uh, trade with Mexico. And so 
um, the German case, for example, comes to mind when Germany held accountable its gun manufacturers saying, well, you're selling to a country that obviously has a criminality issue. And so what I think it's interesting is that how the U.S. is perceived, I think, in the world where it comes to these trade manufacturers, they seem as the most irresponsible uh, partner, as opposed to other countries where, again, they have held accountable um, these gun manufacturers and distributors. And on that note, I should mention that Mexico has also been working very closely with European governments trying to get this uh, exchange of information and intelligence agreements going. And so I think in line with this strategy, what we have seen also for a number of years is also Mexico working with other countries uh, that have large gun uh, producers to precisely, I think, try to um, preclude some of these effects. But again, I don't think anyone is thinking this will market would disappear completely. But what we, you know, the hope here is definitely that the, the consequences of having such, you know, very free trade practices, um, you know, basically are, are stamped and we don't continue to see homicides uh, rising in Mexico and affecting, as I mentioned, these other sectors of the, of the population that either impact democracy or have impact other sectors that were not previously uh, as vulnerable. Thank you, Cecilia. So let me now open for questions from the audience. Uh, and so the first one is uh, probably for Steve. Uh, can you name one successful case where gun manufacturers were found guilty of the violence committed with their products? From Gerardo Gomez. Sure, sure. So the Supreme Courts of Ohio and Indiana have both ruled that uh, gun manufacturers can be liable in cases uh, just like this. Of course, the Supreme Court of Connecticut in the Sandy Hook litigation just uh, ruled that uh, the gun manufacturer uh, in that case is going to answer for its conduct uh, in court. Uh, my colleagues at the Brady Center uh, every day bring individual type uh, uh, gun trafficking, uh, gun violence cases uh, like this, and they've won a trial and they've gotten settlements and uh, uh, all of those are under exceptions uh, to PLACA in domestic uh, cases, but those are uh, some examples. Um, from Francesca Nardi, uh, obviously this case has huge implications for Canada, where the vast, vast majority of gun crime is committed using weapons illegally smuggled from the U.S. Has Canada been involved in this litigation? Canada is not involved in this litigation. This is a litigation of the government of Mexico as a party that has suffered direct and indirect harm. It's our own litigation, and we're not expecting other countries to do this. This is a specific um, circumstances around the harm that Mexico has suffered. What I can say is that uh, foreign governments and organizations around the world are paying attention to what is happening. And I think they all believe in the U.S. courts and the system, and they're going to be expecting uh, an objective uh, ruling. I think that's uh, where they are now, looking at the development of this lawsuit. From... Um... David Bressler, uh, what are the precise objectives of the claim, uh, the specific ruling that's requested, and, and is the issue of causation addressed in the claim? Yeah. Uh, so the relief requested is twofold. One, uh, money damages for harm suffered uh, in the past. These are harms suffered by the government as a government. Things like an increased uh, costs of the police, military, judiciary, social services, health services, all those sorts of uh, direct economic harms suffered by the government. But I think everyone recognizes that uh, a principal uh, form of relief that we, we request is injunctive relief against the manufacturers, requiring them to implement the sorts of reforms that the government of the United States has begged them. Uh, to uh, implement. So, um, you know, those are, those, those are the exact forms of relief that, that we request. With respect to causation, yes, the, the, uh, the, if you look at the complaint, the, uh, uh, on 
I think maybe the third page, but in the introduction to the complaint, we reproduce a, a, a graph that shows, uh, that tracks the uh, production of guns and especially assault weapons in the United States. That's on one line and it goes up starting in 2000 uh, in, in four with the repeal of the uh, assault weapons ban in the United States. Gun production in the United States goes up like that. You look at uh, homicides by gun in Mexico, and you can basically put it on exactly the same line, straight across. When the assault weapons ban uh, is lifted, and uh, the gun the gun manufacturers begin producing uh, all kinds of assault weapons, guns by homicide in Mexico go up almost exactly in the mirror image of the uh, gun production. Uh, data from the United States. Of course, all that will be subject to uh, uh, economic statistical analysis, just like it was done in the op opioid litigation. But uh, this isn't like the bad old days where you just argue about proximate cause and ho hope a judge goes your way. This is a data-rich environment uh, that we live in uh, these days, and causation is a subject of expert testimony or regression analyses, uh, all those sorts of things. And uh, we, uh, I don't lose any sleep at night worrying about uh, proving the causation here. Uh, from Alejandro Dieguez, uh, what is the Firearms Manufacturers Negligent Act? Uh, yeah. The failure to uh, monitor and discipline their distribution systems, the same negligent act in the opioid litigation. Uh, it's as simple as that. The, the manufacturer's policy, as it exists today, is that they will sell their guns to everyone and anyone who has a US federal license to buy a gun, period. No monitoring, no disciplining, no nothing. And you can't operate that way. The only way you get that kind of attitude towards uh, a known safety risk is when there's an absence of tort liability. I know everybody thinks tort reform in the United States is great. Uh, read the articles about what life would be like in the United States with respect to all sorts of products if there were no tort liability in the United States. That is the principal driving force that requires manufacturers, to use the economic term, to internalize their externalities, to make them take account of the harms that they cause. And with respect to domestic policy in the United States, that principal tool of making manufacturers be reasonable and safe has been taken away by PLACA. Fortunately, PLACA does not apply uh, to this case, and at least with respect to the externalities that they uh, cause in the Me in Mexico, they're going to have to internalize those. Uh, from Aura Guerrero, uh, who's an associate at the O'Neill Institute at Georgetown, uh, how likely is that this case ends up in the U.S. Supreme Court, and um, how could a positive outcome in this lawsuit? make other U.S. companies liable for their actions uh, that have effects abroad, particularly in Mexico. Steve, I think you're uh, <laughs> I'm out of questions. <laughs> well, we are at, at a law school, so I, I guess that makes sense. Uh, uh, the number, uh, so the, the question I think realistically isn't whether uh, the case will end up in the Supreme Court. I think people ought to be doing it over and over under on the number of times it's going to end up in the Supreme Court. So I think this is going to be a uh, hard fought, bare knuckles, uh, uh, big time litigation, and we'll, 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 we're going to fight it out. In the end, I think we're going to win. One of the things that I think the wind is at, at our backs in this case, uh, as, as those of you interested in international law know the Supreme Court has been on a kick for the last uh, 10 to 20 years about the non-territorial, non-extraterritorial application of US law. And basically the, the rule that the Supreme Court has come up with and has emphasized over and over again 
that if a U.S. federal statute does not say explicitly that it applies extraterritorially, it doesn't. That if Congress wants a statute to apply extraterritorially, it has to say explicitly in the statute that it applies extraterritorially. So I, uh, I, I can imagine a lot of people in your audience may think, wow, if those plaintiffs uh, get brought before the US Supreme Court on a case like this, they might be in trouble. I think the opposite. On the key issue in the case, a key issue in the case, the applicability of PLACA, the Supreme Court has spoken. The rule with respect to the extraterritorial application of federal statutes in the United States is if, a, if the statute does not say that it applies extraterritorially, it doesn't. And that's the baseline rule here. Then, of course, we have the indications in PLACA itself within the statute expressly that it does not apply extraterritorially. So uh, with respect to the U.S. Supreme Court, um, I think in a case of this magnitude, raising the kinds of uh, issues that it raises, I won't be surprised at all if we end up there. And, I, and I'm sorry, Alvaro, I've forgotten the last uh, part of your question. Yeah, whether this could basically open the door to uh, liability of other companies whose products are causing harm in Mexico. Uh, yes. To the uh, uh, it's 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 of that nature. The thing that's uh, uh, different here uh, is we're, we're bringing a case uh, in the U.S. courts. We do not expect to get a forum non-convenience uh, argument because uh, I think the defendants will want to take their shot at Placa first, uh, and I think it's uh, I think they'd have a hard time establishing that the companies the companies were subject to. Uh, these companies were subject to personal jurisdiction in Mexico. But let me make a, a broader point about this litigation. I think this, is a, a, this case is an interesting example of what I think international uh, private litigation is, is headed. I think that, the, um, I think that a, lar a large part of international law, transboundary disputes are not going to be litigated in uh, international forums. Those forums are not uh, set up to handle this, but I think a large part of the future, given globalization and continued interconnection of the global economy, is that uh, these are going to be, these are the cases, they're going to be transboundary tort cases uh, where the uh, host jurisdiction, the, case, the, the jurisdiction where the case is brought, is going to have to be uh, cosmopolitan. They're going to have to, number one, open uh, their domestic courts to the litigation of international disputes, and they're going to have to be open to the applica application of foreign law. Uh, so for to take this case, for example, what law applies uh, should not be affected at all by the jurisdiction in which, in which the, the case is filed. The international choice of law rules are whatever they are, and they should govern whether or not the case is filed in the United States or in Mexico. Or, and I'm just using our case as, as an example, but I think the future uh, for uh, law students there at Georgetown today, uh, I think you're gonna have an internet, uh, really interesting future ahead of you in terms of international litigation. You're gonna be in domestic courts in the United States litigating uh, cases about harms in other jurisdictions. You're going to be asked to litigate ca uh, litigate cases uh, in South America, Central America, Canada, the EU. You're going to be all over the place in your career uh, litigating uh, cases like this. I think just within the last year, there was, uh, I forget which country in Africa, but some villager, villagers and uh, in a country in Africa, uh, successfully now ha have uh, established jur jurisdiction against Shell Oil in a case in, uh, brought in uh, Belgium and another one uh, in the UK. It's a case like this, public nuisance uh, tort case. And, and the, both of those jurisdictions in the Belgium, in Belgium and the UK have already, the courts there have already indicated their willingness to apply 
the law of the country uh, in Africa. So it will be litigated in those courts applying uh, foreign law over a harm that occurred in Africa. So, uh, you know, get your frequent fire miles ready, uh, you law students out there. This is a large part of your future. And of course, a small announcement, uh, you'll be very well situated to do this if you're a Georgetown law grad. Exactly right. Thank you. <laughs> uh, okay, we have a question from uh, Professor Joseph Page, who is the founder of Carola, our center, and also a tort law scholar. So is the judicial system capable of dealing with this particular problem? What kinds of relief could the tort system provide to the Mexican government? In the tobacco and opioid cases, state governments have sued for monetary losses the governments have sustained. This money is then supposed to be used by state governments to deal with the tobacco and opioid crisis. What would the Mexican government do with any money they recover in the gun case? Could courts adequately supervise how this money is being spent? So thank you, Professor. Um, in any litigation um, started by the Mexican government, because at the end it's for the government of Mexico and we are bound by, by very strict rules. Um, any funds recovered in any litigation go back to our treasury and then the regular budget will allocate it to whatever is more, more needed. But um, I can share uh, with you, Professor, and everybody following this uh, presentation that the general sense is that this money should go to the victims. Even though we don't, we are not representing the, the victims, we're representing the government for the harm suffered. There's a lot of people that have lost limbs. There's a lot of children that have lost their parents. There's a lot of people that lost their means of making a, a regular living. So I am certain that whomever is the president of Mexico, when that um, ruling, federal ruling comes and we can collect the idea of providing services to victims is gonna be in, in the forefront. But again, as a regular government, money goes to the treasury and it's a matter of the treasury to direct those funds to whatever they're more needed. Um, I, my personal opinion is that it shouldn't go to buy more guns or to buy more uh, security infrastructure. It should go to respond to the harm that has been mainly for the victims and other things that we have spent a lot of money and distracted a lot of resources mm -hmm. in responding to the illicit trafficking of guns that is facilitated by these companies. That money should be allocated to other things. Our current budget should be concentrated in other needs instead of responding to something that is created by people that are profiting from this harm. So to be continuing in terms of where that money would go, but assuring that victims are always in the forefront. Okay, so next question from Professor Filomila Tsukala, also at Georgetown Law. If the court finds that a uh, placa statute does apply against your best efforts and against legislative history, as you mentioned, what evidence would you try to present specifically as to the marketing guns to cartels argument? Is there any data there? Because even media like NPR and the New York Times in the US seem to think that that will be a really hard argument to prove. Well, there are a number of uh, statutory exemptions to the immunity that PLACA applies. So in, in the event that it does apply, uh, one of our principal arguments will be the, the, the predicate offense uh, uh, exception. Uh, and that is uh, there are all sorts of both uh, uh, state laws uh, that the gun manufacturers are uh, violating by engaging in this conduct. Uh, and also uh, federal statutes on, on the uh, sale of guns. So that when, for example, when a, a gun trafficker uh, buys or uses a straw purchaser to buy uh, the gun in order to traffic it across the border, that violates US federal law that says uh, only uh, 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 
a you need to buy the gun for resale, you need a federal license. It violates uh, federal law on U.S. exports of guns. You need a license to export uh, the gun. So that to the extent that we can show that the, the gun manufacturers are aiding and abetting that conduct, uh, there's an exception to PLACA, even in the event that it applies. Then, of course, we have the template of the uh, of the Sandy Hook litigation with respect to uh, unlawful marketing uh, of the guns. And we gave examples of this uh, in the complaint where we reproduce some of the ads uh, for these guns that talk about, you know, this, this, uh, uh, this semi-automatic weapon will help you uh, achieve your mission. Great tactical use of this gun, ready for combat, uh, you know, all this, the sorts of military uh, imagery uh, that, the, that the manufacturers use in their marketing uh, of these uh, uh, guns. So uh, we think that there are several exceptions uh, to PLACA, uh, statutory exceptions in the event that it does apply. But as I say, our principal argument uh, is that it doesn't apply. Secondly, if it does purport to apply, it can't apply under international law. And then if we get to our third series of arguments, uh, then we're down to uh, exceptions under PLACA. Um, so a question from Gerardo Gomez. Why are other big manufacturers like Sig Sauer left out? Their guns are also used in crimes in Mexico and the Mexican government also buys guns from them as from the other mark makers. Um, the, our lawsuit is directed to the gun manufacturers from whom the higher number of guns are found in Mexico. So the defendants are responsible for the higher number of guns found in Mexico in crime scenes. Um, Six Hour is a company that conduct businesses with um, a lot of governments around the world. It's, um, it's a different conversation that is, is a good opportunity to, to talk about. There is a, a, a licit and regulated trade of weapons. Sadly, the world needs weapons and governments have the monopoly of the use of force. So armed forces will buy guns from companies, legally established. What is important to highlight here is that those same companies, as I mentioned, that facilitate the selling uh, and the trafficking to organized crime and criminals are also selling through legal exportation to armed forces around the world. And this selling to armed forces is very strictly regulated and monitored, including notions of final user, But there's no a similar mechanism in the distribution practices to um, gun stores in the southern part of, of the US. So the conversation is not that, why not it, we're, we're suing six hour or we're buying to six hour, perhaps the Mexican government should stop buying to all the American companies until the gun sellers, until it's proven that they have strict um, distribution policies to sanction those that facilitate the illicit trafficking. But that's a, a, a different conversation. Now, Mexico is doing its homework in finding accountable those that lose um, guns. There's a minor number of guns um, lost by armed forces. And it responds on the multilateral level in the ATT, the Convention for um, um, Trade of Arms. It informs of how arms are being used, who are buying them, where they're allocated. The difference between the guns um, lost or used incorrectly in the legal side of the gun trade is very small in comparison to the half a million weapons illicitly trafficked from the US into Mexico every year. 
Okay, we have uh, four minutes and uh, there's, uh, there's another question and then I, I have uh, one last question. So a question from Glo Du. Um, how do you respond to the argument that the fault is the Mexican government's corruption? Is there a recognition that corruption is used by gun manufacturers to introduce weapons into Mexico? Heckler and Koch was fined in Germany for a similar case related to Mexico. Um, um, yeah, no, it, if we talk about corruption, perhaps the question would be how corrupt is the gun industry? And then I would ask how corrupt are the government agents involved in the route of a gun going from a factory in a state in Massachusetts where we're suing all the way to Guerrero in Mexico. Um, it's not only Mexico, the one that should be looked at for its share of responsibility. If we're gonna discuss about the responsibility in, whole, in all this mix, we should look at all the actors. And what I mentioned of these four actors that we have identified is the US government. How much is the US government doing and how much could it do more or improve what it's already doing? What is Mexico doing and what can we improve? How can we prosecute better criminals in both sides of the border and the companies? Now, to say that Mexico is responsible for this, I think that doesn't excuse or take away the level, the very high degree of responsibility of the gun manufacturers. Let's have the conversation about what Mexico should do better, but let's have the conversation about the liability that these gun manufacturers have and the liability and responsibility of all the other actors about here. If we're gonna enter about in that discussion, let's look at all the sides, all the angles in this mix. And the government of Mexico is ready to talk about this, but not only from one angle. Let's talk about everybody responsible in the death and harm to people, to women and men in Mexico and in the US. So I have one final question. Um, you mentioned the multiplicity of actors in this phenomenon, Alejandro, and there are certainly a multiplicity of tools as well. So you refer to the diplomatic efforts. Now we're seeing a strategic litigation in US courts, but there's also market tools or you know the power of the purse in the case of Mexico. So Mexico has seen a, a dramatic increase in its resources devoted to the armed forces, there's an escalation of the militarization that actually is worrying a lot of people and a lot of the Mexican society because of what it, this represents to its democracy. But that means that Mexico, uh, as you were indicating, is also a legal buyer of all these companies' products. Doesn't that give Mexico leverage to try to change these companies' behavior? I, I don't have a picture or don't have data in terms of how much Mexico spends in buying guns from US companies. But I would imagine that that certainly gives Mexico certain, certain pressure to apply to gun manufacturers to change its practices. I think the audience will have a lot to write about this. I think this is one of those open questions that I, I believe should remain open for discussion, but I'll just say it this way. I'm the legal advisor and um, I cannot address all the questions, but um, from my personal opinion as Mexican, we trust in the US and the US system. We trust in US companies. We are buyers, like good faith buyers. What our armed forces are buying, we need guns to respond to the armed violence. Of course, we would like to have to spend less money in weapons and more in other things, to address other things. But we trust the US companies and we trust the, the, the US system. Perhaps if the companies that are aware or should be aware, they are on notice that their guns are ending in crime scenes, they should take responsibility without the need of a litigation or the power of the purse, they should make changes. Now, we're neighbors and friends of the US. That's why we buy things to the US. 
we trade with the US and we want to continue having this legal trade. And in that regard, because we believe in the legal trade of goods between um, our countries and through our borders, we want to fix the illegal trade. And that's why we're suing. And that's why I feel optimistic. This is not about Mexico against the US. It's Mexico and the US for a transparent, responsible, and accountable trade of weapons. OK, and on that note, our time is up. I want to thank uh, Cecilia Farfan, Steve Shadow, and, and Alejandro Solorio for joining us today for a great uh, conversation on uh, this very important problem. Uh, thanks to our audience for joining us today and also to the Georgetown team at Carola, um, uh, Lilia Muni, Sarah Min, and uh, Kyle Bernardos uh, for making this event possible. Thank you so much and have a good day. <laughs>